Okay. Uh, yeah, the reason we're here. Uh, Alan Pitts, thank you for uh, agreeing to travel up to Harrisburg and uh, give a presentation. I'm sorry, I'm not there with you. Uh, Alan is a geologist at the USGS and uh, in Reston, Virginia. And uh, he had been, uh, he had completed his PhD at the University of Camerino in Italy, uh, where he studied the evolution of deep and shallow marine basins. He also had previously, according to the internet, been a professor of North Virginia Community College. And uh, also, I guess it, at Camerino, Italy, that was somehow affiliated with uh, James Madison University's field camp. Sounds like a great field camp. Uh, he has had numerous, uh, as you would expect, numerous publications and presented it a lot of uh, prestigious locations to the GSA, the a American Geophysical Union, the AGU, which I assume is the European Geophysical Union. And he uh, specializes in integrating field methods and digital technologies. Uh, his publications relate to, as you would call, uh, expect stratigraphy, sedimentary processes, uh, of, and seems to trend toward uh, turbidite sequence and uh, fluid sounds like uh, catastrophic fluid flow, but I'm not sure if it was catastrophic. Uh, and and of course, I've, I've understood that he keeps a home for meandering streams. <laughs> uh, and I also want to compliment him on his wonderful title slide. Anyway, if there's no other things, thanks again, Alan. I'm looking forward to listening to your talk. All right, Alan, the floor is yours. OK. OK, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the really nice uh, introduction, Kent. And thanks for inviting me to be here, Al. Uh, I'm just going to roll straight into it. I'll, I'll say that I'm really happy to be here. It's my first HAGS, um, but I have spent some time at some conferences with um, you know, my new friends from the Pennsylvania Geologic Survey. So not only am I really happy to be here. Let's see, can you all see me? I'm not sure if the at home people can see me, but I feel like I'm in that zone. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to be here in person. I'm really happy that our talks are, you know, you know, going back to in person and y'all are restarting this. So I'm happy to be here for that. And let's just hop, hop straight into this. All right, so this talk is about the way that we tend to see rocks with different perspectives and then build models from those um, observations at the outcrop. And that's fine, right? This is what we're all trained to do as geologists. But what I'm going to talk about next are some of the challenges that I've encountered when outcrop scale depositional models are upscaled and used for the basis of regional scale stratigraphic frameworks. I'll talk about what I think are some of the deeper kind of philosophical esoteric um, roots of these issues. And then um, talk about um, right, some of the issues that we have with the data that we're producing that comes from our perspectives on the outcrops, which comes from our interpretations of the models, and then talk about Finally, the ending, um, talk about digital data as a preservation tool for nearly, nearly an unbiased way forward. Well, since I wanted to start out by talking about the perspectives that we bring to looking at the rocks, and we're all geologists, I thought I would do that in a really fun way by presenting the generalized stratigraphic chart of Alan Pitts. And you can see, I just thought I would dial it up this way because we're all geologists, we like looking at data this way. And I just sort of broke this up into the major phases. I started um, in the Appalachians. So I did my undergraduate work 
at George Mason University. Uh, that's me as a young boy living in my <laughs> home of folded Silurian quartzite. And at George Mason University, I had the pleasure of learning from people like Rick Diccio. I don't know if anybody in this room or online is uh, familiar with Rick Diccio, but he's kind of a classic Appalachian stratigrapher from my transect a little further south and just a really swell guy. He cared really deeply about the value of field experiences at the undergraduate level. And I just really clinged to a lot of the things that he was teaching and a lot of his perspectives that he taught. I went to field camp in Ireland with James Madison University's program, um, which was really nice because I got to move out of the Appalachians and move in. You know, that's why we go to field camp to look at different rocks, develop that new perspective. About the end of my undergrad uh, era, I, I was really lucky to intersect with um, Dan Doctor at the USGS, and I went to work with him as an intern. And that kind of went on. That was punctuated as I transitioned into grad school into where I was mostly working as a starving graduate student. Um, but my research changed into looking not at these like big picture narratives that I had been introduced to as a student in the Appalachians, but instead going on a really deep dive, deep dive into marine depositional systems, right? And so my work was primarily on deep marine depositional systems, channelized and low bait turbidite um, systems. In the middle of that is uh, interrupted by the 2016 uh, 6.5 earthquake that happened in Norcia, Italy. That was um, about 15 kilometers from my house where I lived in this really neat little medieval uh, university town. And these are the places that I that I was really lucky to work on. The Gorgoglione Flish is a deep water deposit and the Playa Pleistocene shallow water systems. I'm going to talk a little bit about those and use those as examples of some of the things that we're talking about. I just kind of felt, since we're all Appalachian stratigraphers in here, that if I focus on Appalachian stratigraphy, there might be the risk that somebody feels like I'm pointing a finger at them or pointing a finger at me. So I just thought we'd talk about Italian stratigraphy <laughs> and I'll make my examples with those rocks. All right, well, uh, as I was finishing up uh, my PhD, I was uh, lucky to design my own field camp between George Mason University and the University of Camerino where I was. So I got to collaborate with the great professors that I had back in Fairfax, Virginia, and build this really cool program that we ran for five years. And that was nice because I just kind of continued to develop a, a sort of mapping perspective, but teaching a mapping perspective to students. And then COVID interrupted everything. And you know, the, the rocks I was working on at that stage were the ones that I could see from my computer monitor, right? Just like everyone else. And then I landed back in the Appalachians just a couple of months ago with, to join these fine folks at the Appalachian Basin Mapping Project. So that's Dan Doctor and Alex Gray up top there. Some of you know them if y'all are watching at home. Um, hi. So, right, we've seen this meme before, right? You kind of start as an undergrad and you're thinking like, all right, I've got this tiny nugget of a brain developing you know, <laughs> about geological concepts and I'm ready to take that to the next level in grad school where the synapses start developing and I'm pulling things all together. And then what I thought, I would just come back to the Appalachians and what? I don't know. Like, just <laughs> resolve all these issues with only the power of my mind. And, and that's not at all how it went, right? The point that I'm at is something more like this, where I, I just feel like I'm trying to figure things out. Oops, I'm just trying to figure things out. So let's talk about a little bit of the perspectives that I feel like I've developed in just kind of my short career. And these perspectives are the ones that we bring to the field as mapping geologists. These perspectives are the ones that help us collect to data, decide what data we collect from rocks. So this is one that's based on clastic phases analysis. And this is the type of work that I did in grad school, right? Where instead of thinking of really, really large things like development of the Appalachian Basin or development of uh, the Catskill Delta, things like this, I was working on really, really fine scale details. It was industry money that funded us to work in the deep water environment to try to understand the sub seismic details of this. So what did we do? We'd go to look at these type of outcrops. Oops. Well, we'd go to look at that outcrop in um, photo A. And this figure is just showing the zooming ability of a really awesome gigapan image I made of that outcrop. But Essentially, we'd be doing the work that, you know, we all were trained to do. We go to the outcrop and we record the data. But in classic phases analysis, right, the real power, if you talk to people that love 
Casey's analysis, <laughs> um, is that this is a tool that we can use to describe and classify any body of sediment according to all of its sedimentary characteristics, right? So Facey's analysis lets us take these outcrop uh, observation inferences, build facies for each one of those, link facies to processes, group facies together to describe environments. And then now we've moved from, you know, interpreting individual facies to the lower right, building a facey schematic. And that still might not send, make, make a lot of sense what you're actually looking at there. But then when we move from facies, processes, environment, and then upscale that into base and evolution, we move to developing our, um, our, our geological cartoonogram, right? Or a conceptual model. And what I learned in grad school is that this here in figure A in the lower left is that there's a lot of value in this in the academic community, right? Build your observations. I'm sorry, build the interpretations from your observations and then develop a conceptual model. Because right now, this communicates exactly what we found in this location, that there's a large channelized surface here. It has an erosional relationship with the tabular deposits below. We've interpreted facies two here as the frontal lobe deposits. And this channel is eroding into that. And it has a unique sort of facies of channel elements inside there. And from that, we used it to build this really big model about how this was a turbidite channel that in stage one was depositing its frontal lobes. And then something happened that that turbidite channel now cannibalized its frontal lobes. How did that happen, right? Maybe the entire sedimentary system is stepping forward. Maybe it's the entire shelf that's stepping forward. And those are the type of the models, right? And you see how quickly these models expand from bed scale, centimeter scale, decimeter scale bed forms into evolution of the basin, right? But we do all this with a careful movement, right? Our observations are linked to facies. Those are linked to references, evidence from other examples. All right, well, let's talk about another perspective. Geologic mapping, which I feel like has changed a whole lot since I was a student. Our basic goals of geologic mapping, we want to understand the composition, the structure, um, geologic materials of the Earth's surface and of depth, produce geologic map products, and the fundamental boiling block of that is the formation. And the formation is what we argue about, where they go, where the boundaries. Well, that's a geologist mapping perspective, but there's another bigger perspective out there that's not in this room with us right now, but they're always present. And that's the USGS National Collaborative Geologic Mapping Program. By the way, that's not me, right? I work for a mapping project that is funded by the Collaborative Mapping Program. So in a way, all of us that are involved in geologic mapping in this country, we work for them. And their goals, which are our goals, are seamless mapping by 2030 2D and 3D coverage of the country. So as mappers, we need to be able to adopt uh, a perspective on the rocks that is a little bit bigger from these uh, fine scale details. And because there's all of this big momentum coming from the people that fund all mapping, that we need to clear up these interstate inconsistencies. And so that's the type of thing that's, you know, a lot of these conversations are going on here at the PA survey. We did something, we hosted something a few months ago. Um, and so, yeah, geologic mapping has changed. I feel like in the time, classic geologic mapping was the mapping that I was trained to do. And maybe some of you were trained to do that at field camp on a topo based map with a pencil and trying to find yourself based on the topography. But if you work in the Appalachians and you work in soliciclastic units, um, some of your mapping might be highly dependent on core, the detailed stratigraphy, and that lost skill set of reading contour maps, right? All of us that are really crazy about LIDAR, people that like did mapping before LIDAR, they would tell you, hey, those contour maps are already in 3D. You just need to you know, teach your eyes how to read them. Um, but that's a skill. And anybody who did mapping pre-LIDAR, uh, my hat goes off to you because the work that I find in those maps are just so good. But with new data, they could need a little bit of revision, right? Just like our maps will need revisions in the future. Um, so modern geologic mapping is really driven a lot by LIDAR and digital data collection. 
we're supported by remote sensing, right? People are developing aerial drone programs. People are developing um, airborne geophysical. We're going to have some airborne geophysical data coming along probably. And new data is always on the way. All right. So now let's talk about back to the perspective of a mapping geologist, right? And this is something that has just come from years of talking to students in the field about this thing. And what I've found is that this is an important distinction that students don't always grasp and that takes some practice even for myself as an instructor to remind ourselves of the uh, importance of distinguishing between top-down and bottom-up perspectives. Now, I don't want to claim to be like the genius who invented all this because my perspective on this is very much informed from a lot of conversations in the field with that person in the lower left with me, Steve Whitmire. He's the director of the James Madison field camp in Ireland and just a geologist that I really respect for the way that he thinks about rocks. Steve uh, and Lynn Fichter from JMU, they wrote a lot of this in a really nice field guide from 2010. It's tuned into the rocks sort of at a lower transect across where 66, Route 66 cuts the section. But if you want to dig more into like sort of the things that I'm going to be talking about, they write about it in their field guide and then talk about how they apply these things in the field um, on the field trip. OK, so let's talk about a top down approach, right? So this top down approach relies on conceptual models. These conceptual models are like plate tectonic regimes, subsurface models, basin development. And the way I think about this is these models, they reach down, in a sense, with subjective data. That data can change with perspective, right? So our plate tectonic regimes and what we think about this part of the Appalachians, new data can change that, right? So our, our conceptual models that are living in the cloud, we might think, those can change at any time. So, but I don't want to like cast these as errors in our thinking or logical fallacies because they have a lot of power. They actually let us do geology in the field because using these conceptual models, they can guide our observations at the outcrop by taking fragmentary information and placing them in a regional context, right? Maybe some of you remember being a geologist and walking up to an outcrop, a young geologist walking up to the outcrop and you say, great, I'm looking at rocks. And then somebody came along and said, well, there's a fault right here. And did you notice these beds? And then all of a sudden your perspective changes and you started seeing those things. So our conceptual models help guide our observations. Which are the observations that we should select as making in the field book and which should not? Conceptual models let us test our hypotheses by making prediction of what should be observed based on what's been observed. So let's like consider these two students standing at the outcrop. I don't know what type of rock this is, but I just imagine that they observed this hummocky cross stratification. And what happens is that when the students are looking at their hummocky cross stratification, they say, um, oh, hold on, I'm sorry. Um, so this is our top down and the bottom up. And so the bottom up relies on empirical observations, right? It starts with your outcrop data as the primary data. We can use our bottom up processes to test the inferences and predictions of our theoretical models because they're built upward from objective data, the data that doesn't change, right? So this outcrop of Hummocky cross certification, it has a bed thickness, it has a grain size. Those are the pieces of the story that don't change. And so now the student is saying, wow, look at these neat beds of Hummocky cross certification. The other student says, ah, but this formation has been interpreted as an alluvial fan system, right? So what have we found? Our depositional model does not predict this type of feature. So that leads us to suspect that our model is incomplete or wrong. So where do we go from there? You know, knives out, right? <laughs> no, that's not where we're going. Because what we've actually done, congratulations, we've all just identified an opportunity to learn through some applied research, right? We've noticed an area where our model is incomplete. So if you uh, follow the Steve Whitmire, Lynn Fichter school of processing your outcrops in your mind, what they would have us do is use our top-down deductive approach relying on our conceptual models at the same time as our bottom-up inductive approach relying on empirical observations and constantly always pits them against each other right so that at the end of the day your 
Top-down deductive approach is guiding your observations, but your observations are checking your conceptual models. I, I kind of like to think about this in a different way that's not, you know, two guys arm wrestling from the movie Predator. Uh, instead, I like to think about this as like a game of Pong that I'm playing with myself, and that these, like, bottom-up observations are a high, become hypotheses that can now be sent up to sound off of something, like a conceptual model, right? When that hypothesis born from an observation goes up to the cloud, it bounces off that pong paddle I'm imagining, meaning it agrees with a conceptual model up there, and that's now ready to come down, and that's a hypothesis we can all agree with. By the way, these folks on the lower left, only people in the room more stoked than me to see pong on the screen. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I, I, I felt like, you know, this philosophical deep dive wouldn't be complete without like a 19th century philosopher on the screen. So William James was somebody that I was really into when I was a young student and his will to believe, he talked about a hypothesis as anything proposed to be believed. Now, William James was a philosopher, a psychologist. Um, and so when he was talking about hypotheses, a lot of these had to do with like, Religious beliefs, those types of hypotheses, hypotheses that might guide you towards your personal truth. But he also looked at scientific hypotheses in the same way. And he said that hypotheses can be alive or dead. And that a live hypothesis is one that appears to be a genuine possibility to whomever it is proposed. Whereas a dead hypothesis does not appear to be a real possibility to whom it is proposed, right? So I'm just kind of thinking about this again as my hypothesis model and actually, According to this live dead sort of formula, we might think of our conceptual model as a filter that lets certain things pass through and other things not. And in this case, if my hypothesis is consistent with my conceptual model, then it's alive. If my hypothesis is inconsistent, inconsistent with my conceptual model, it's a dead hypothesis, right? And so, you know, that just seems really unfair Right? Like, look at those two faces on the screen. Nobody wants that to be their hypothesis. But it turns out that some of these conceptual models are really, really robust. So when you're thinking, like, why would anybody rule out a hypothesis just because it doesn't fit their conceptual model? Well, we do it all the time. Let me show everybody a dead as a doornail geologic hypothesis right now. That's a slump deposit, first of all. And it looks a little bit weird because it's in this farm. This is in Italy, and this is a 3D model. It's not a, a picture, but that slump deposit is in a farmer's field. And the farmer can't plow where the uh, slope deformation is. So they plow around it, which means it creates this really nice contrast where the grass always grows on the slump deposit. Each year it goes down a little bit when it rains, and then the farmer keeps plowing his fields. Well, all right, cool. So what's wrong with that? Ready for the dead hypothesis that's just dead on arrival? Flow direction. I think that landslide went uphill. All right, cool. Nobody is willing to accept that. We're just not going to do that. And the reason why is because in this sense, our conceptual model is really robust. It's built on some really strong foundational points, like the laws of physics, right? Gravity. Modern examples, we know how landslides work. Ancient records, we've seen them in the rock record. Observational evidence, that farmer might be able to tell you, you know, uh, Last month I was plowing my field, and then this month I have a landslide there. There could be an eyewitness, eyewitness account. So somebody might have observed that going downhill. And so by the strength of this conceptual model and how rigid it is, we can already say that anti-gravity slope movements, that's just a dead hypothesis. None of, none of us are really going to entertain that. All right, so um, that's how we sometimes use these conceptual models to guide what can be live or dead hypotheses. And now I kind of want to come to like the crux of what I see as this problem is that this is actually between stratigraphy and mapping and the way that we, these different perspectives that might exist in the various subdisciplines within these, but our stratigraphy is built from observations, hypotheses, but interpretations and conceptual models do enter into that. We use it as mapping geologists all the time when we say that this formation is marine and this formation is non-marine. Those are interpretations, but all of us who are mapping geologists in the room know we're using that as a shorthand. When we say that this is a non-marine sand, 
we're saying that it lacks marine fossils, that it maybe has some terrigenous fossils. It has a sedimentary character that leads us away from marine deposition. But that's all hard to say. So when we say that this is a marine sand, we use this as a shorthand, but the problem becomes when those interpretations, we know the difference, right? But when those interpretations and conceptual models make it into our description of map units and make it into our map product deliverables, then it becomes a little bit problematic, not only for our end users of the maps, but the future generations of mappers. Because now what, they, what are they trying to do? Trying to read the rocks, maybe guided by our interpretations, or maybe they're trying to look through our interpretations to what is there instead. So this is a point where I'm just going to talk about a couple of these sources of these issues that I think. And one of them is that our conceptual models are often incomplete. So like this house model, it's like mostly there, right? You can identify all the rooms. You can imagine living in that house. This model predicts pretty accurately what a house is and the components that would be involved in there, right? So if this is a conceptual model and then, you know, I showed you uh, a brick, then you could say, well, okay, this brick fits into my conceptual model nicely because it's a part of the house. But what this model lacks, it's incomplete. Like there's no roof. So what happens if I hand you a roofing tile? Well, that's actually not inside this conceptual model. So this model is incomplete, which means that the real situation is more complex than we imagine. And I think that this happens all the time in sedimentary environments, that any given sedimentary environment may have many different depositional elements. Sometimes we don't see them all. Sometimes we do see them all. Sometimes we only right, see what's available. And this is just depending on if they're there or not. It's also depending on the paleogeography and the orientation of the outcrop that we might be seeing an incomplete story. All right, so I'll just jump into a um, example here. And this is from the Plyo Pleistocene um, system of Italy. I was really lucky to work on, I don't know, just a diverse range of, of uh, sedimentary rocks that um, I thought was really fun. And so these occur on the Adriatic side uh, of the Apennine chain, uh, there in the central part of the peninsula in the region of Le Marche. And these deposits, are 700,000 years old. They've been dated by biostratigraphy at 700,000 years old. So these are like the youngest rocks I've ever had my hands on. And I don't know, maybe some, some of you have like handled some fresh volcanics in Hawaii or something that were younger than that. But these, I felt like, whoa, this is really young. And I'm just, I'm truly playing with something that's at the interface between uh, sediment and sedimentary rock. Well, why do, we, why do I want to talk about this? This outcrop was a, a piece of research that I was lucky to participate in when I was in uh, Italy. And the issue here is with these really awesome, stunning dune prospects and the fact that they're intermixed with all these different types of sediment. If we were going to follow our, our conceptual model, Right, so these are from a shallow marine system. And in the shallow marine world, we tend to break things up into beach, shore face, offshore transition, and offshore. And a lot of these zones hinge on like fair weather wave base, storm weather wave base, where the swash zone reaches, where the beach goes back to the Aeolian dunes. And so if you were looking at these dunes, right, these, these cross strata, their wavelength is way too large to be crossfeds, right? So these, these must be dunes. And so many times what we do is we impose a stratigraphic framework on our mapping. And we go to the field and we map things like shore face versus the beach, right? Because we look at the deposits, we build the interpretations, use those as a framework to map it. But in this case, what we had a really hard time doing was putting these structures into context with everything else. And so I'm just showing you a gigapan image here. It's going to move around while I talk. This image is made about of about, I don't know, 500 or 700 photos or something. And it can go all the way down to coarse grain size. Um, so you're looking at coarse sand down there, right in between one and two millimeter domain. And I'm just going to zoom around and look at some of these structures. So we've got these like really nice tongues of gravel coming down and then these dune beds sitting on top of them. And so 
when we started to look at these, we you know built a lot of digital data so we could you know in carefully investigate it from the office. But we found a real problem trying to resolve how are these dune beds sitting on top of what we think are beach face type deposits. And it wasn't until we went there and we were able to carefully. Oh, sorry. This is just a joke that I was going to make about the real faces analysis. Um, <laughs> this is some you know, local kid that actually thought faces analysis was vandalism. Um, so that's the same video. So what did we come up with when we were able to put together the entire context and not just looking at uh, one set of dunes sitting on top of one set of gravel, we were able to establish that these uh, these dunes were in the beach face system. We were able to carefully connect them genetically to structures that let us know that these were formed during um, extreme storm events on the beach, right? And so this is where I talk, this is the point that I make about our models being incomplete, right? So this outcrop, we bring students there and we tell them that this is a fossilized beach, right? This is a cross section across the beach. You're looking at a shoreline perpendicular profile. And, and then we tell the students all to imagine you're walking on a beach and what are the processes you see, right? So now all of us, if you imagine walking on the beach and what types of things that you see, well, like, I don't know, Al was probably imagining a nice walk um, after sunset, and maybe Haley was imagining a nice walk in the morning doing some shell collecting before anybody else got there. Me, I was thinking of the beach during hurricane season, right? So as we imagine these sedimentary environments, we know that like the conditions are varied, the processes are varied, and the facies might not always be there. So we build models that are often incomplete because we're not able to see everything that's there. This is a slide that I'll see at least three times, but um, this is another issue that we have between stratigraphy and mapping that comes with scale. And the point is here that all stratigraphic logs, these, this is a stratigraphic log, and all stratigraphic logs have a certain baked in limitation because the person that made that stratigraphic log was thinking about something in their mind before they made it. And the reason I know that is because Right, this one is at the centimeter scale. If you want to read more about this, you can see this uh, great article by by Jane Job, 2021, uh, where he talks about this issue and the fact that right, this is a centimeter scale from thin section. This is bed scale meters, you know, 12 meters. This is detailed, but not every bed. And this is a formation scale, something that a mapping geologist might put together. And its meters are zero to three thousand. And the problem with all of these scales, including the one that I drew in my notebook, is that if I asked you what's the thickness of that bed, no one can tell me. And if I ask you what's the thickness of that bed, no one can tell me, not even me. I recorded that data. And the reason why is because this, this, this graphic image of stratigraphy can be improved, right? It's not, it's on the edge of quantitative qualitative, right? Because we can't extract all the data we want out of that. And, and I, you know, I don't want to upset anybody because like I've made kilometers and kilometers of stratigraphic columns too. And if somebody came and told me later, this isn't real data, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if we'd be friends after that, but um, okay. So I just wanted to keep on a little bit about stratigraphy, but come back to this idea about our model being incomplete. And, and this is another change in perspective that I had when I when I went to Europe, because what do we do with our naming convention? We name formations over places, localities, geographic locations that you know are going to let you find it, towns, rivers, streams, and um, follow that around. What do the Italians do? The Italians name their rocks. This is something that's, that's really nice of them, and it was really nice for me since I didn't speak Italian when I got there, is they name their rocks based on description. So right here, the Calcare Massiccio, that means massive limestone. I mean, kind of like it looks, right? Uh, Rosso Ammonitico, it's the pink ammonite formation. Uh, Where's uh, one of them that's over here, Scalia Rossa. Scalia means like scaly or like flakes. It also means pink. So it's like the scaly pink limestone. 
And what I think about that, when I think about all of these conversations that we're having, I don't want to say they're issues or they're challenges because I feel like we're just all like working really well together, but some of these things become contentious oftentimes because our place names might reside in our states or within our mapping areas, right? So this has happened to me, right? I've been to sheer West Virginia <laughs> to try to understand the original type locality, right? But this isn't about shear. This is about something in our minds, right? So the shear formation was defined and described at shear West Virginia. And so now I'm looking at other deposits similar to that. But when I want to check it, where do I go? Back to shear. But why? Is it because the deposits at shear somehow are the most shear of all shear deposits? Like, let's think about this for a second, because if we were to compare that to a modern environment, where would we go in the Chesapeake Bay to core for the most Chesapeake Bay type deposits? Where would we go in the Outer Banks to find the most barrier island type deposits? So, like, there's a misconnect there that we sometimes imagine the type localities of stratigraphy being the oracle of those units and the basis for comparison that we need to come back to. It's probably because that's the foundational literature, but somehow baked into that is the idea that if you want to revise the uh, Black Forest bed, well, you better go back to Black Forest and talk to uh, whoever's quad that's in. But, right, the, the rocks don't know quads, the rocks don't know states, the rocks don't know formations, we put all that on them. Another issue with stratigraphy and mapping it is that when our, our regional mapping conventions are based on pre-LIDAR sections, those can be improved, right? I mean, I just want to say again, pre-LIDAR mappers, y'all are awesome. We, you know, we're not worthy. But when we look at that data sitting on top of LIDAR, we just recognize that it can be, it can be improved, right? And again, that's going to happen to us in another generation. Our data will be improved. So, Pre-LIDAR type sections, when you go back to these places to try to consult the oracle of the original defined formations, what you may find there, if it's in the heavily vegetated Appalachian sections, is no outcrop. And worse, that when a lot of these things were defined, they didn't have the tools that we have to generate the same type of content to illustrate it to us. This plane table section uh, by Denison was really awesome at that time when it was made and informative and instructive, but it has a diminished value now. Because when we go back to these sections and look at them in LIDAR, what we start to realize is that depending on where you cut the section, you might have a very different interpretation of the rocks. <laughs> All right, so now I want to switch to the last segment of my talk. And it's about digital data as a quote unquote unbiased uh, spell check. Um, unbiased record. And I hope that this can kind of segue into what Al is going to be talking about. Al, are you giving that talk or other no, people? Craig's going to do it next. Okay, yeah. So I hope that this will segue into the next HAG's talk about this call for creation of digital data and how it can serve us in the future. So what are we looking at here right now? Um, you all should recognize it, those of you that are on my uh, field trip for the Appalachian Stratigraphy Conference, we were at this outcrop. And this is a point cloud uh, strip log of an outcrop. All of those other models that we were looking at before, they were kind of created in the same way. Some of them were from the ground, some of them were from the air. But now this is a digital point cloud data set, but it's georeference and it's scaled. So look at it sitting right there on top of real topography. I can move that point cloud. This point cloud has, what is that? It's like, I don't know, one million points or something. But I can set that LIDAR, I can set that point cloud on top of LIDAR, and I can zoom around to put it inside a regional context, right? So we're not just working inside a black box with a 3D rock. We're placing our 3D rock into real 3D geospace. And how that changes, you can see these yellow and white lines. Those are the lines that I've put up there, indicating like these major lithographic changes. But instead of giving something to someone which might have some pre-baked interpretations based on it, or matters relating to scale that I created, I can give instead 
data that is clearly separated in its interpretations and its observations, right? So what are we looking at on the top? That's a point cloud model, and you might be able to make out like that's a West Virginia sign there. You know, that's the outcrop that we were walking on there. This is corridor H, US Route 48. What's on the right, the photorealistic model. The photorealistic model is an interpolation, but that point cloud model, it's real data. It's X, Y, Z, R, G, B. And then the export. So that's the raw data on top, point cloud model, photorealistic. The exports from that could be something like this ortho rectified mosaic image. It's clean, it's scaled, it's georeferenced. You could use that as a base map to do your own stratigraphy on that. Say you had like, a really nice data set of chemostratigraphy or chronostratigraphy annotated on that base map, just like we use LIDAR, right? So this LIDAR is interpretation free. It's data. It comes from a laser return. It's XYZ. It doesn't have RGB color, but it has XYZ. And what happens? Our lines and our polygons sit on top of that image. But as we all know, those lines can change. And they probably will change, right? We like to think that our, we, we try to make maps that are accurate in their representation of the reality, but we all know that as data changes, the map might change. So what I'm striving for is building outcrop maps that can serve the same purpose as a LIDAR image so that right, so that um, data can be delivered uh, in a way that's really usable later without the interpretations cooked in. This is just a slide talking about how this is done, right? The structure for motion photogrammetry is, 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 a, is a photography technique by cameras moving around the object and they build this cloud by knowing the focal length, the position of the camera and the angles. I won't go into that a lot, but what I will say is that it's like really, really close to LiDAR data. Think about it as the same way as you think about LiDAR. It's gathered in a different way, but the way it returns, the way that it reads, the accuracy that it can have is really competitive with LiDAR. The difference is LiDAR is thrown from a plane and this you can do anywhere. You could float it from a balloon. You could be on the ground with a camera. You could use a drone, right? Um, and so I, I, I did a lot of that in the past. I like working from the ground. I like the versatility. You could use your smartphone to develop some of these. And Here's what's great about it, right? They give us another tool for producing, improving stratigraphic data, right? Because what, what I feel like the conversation used to be was bringing mapping up to speed with stratigraphy, right? Stratigraphy has evolved in the last couple of decades, right? For sequence stratigraphy and facies analysis and things like that. So I feel like what happened, like starting in 2000 was stratigraphy was outpacing geologic mapping. But I now feel like that has reversed because uh, geologic mapping has had a huge influx. Like in 2012, I can remember looking at LIDAR over one tiny place uh, over the Blue Ridge province. And we were like, boy, as soon as we get LIDAR in other places, this is gonna be great. And now it's like, we've got LIDAR everywhere and that's just absolutely changed the game. And I feel like it's the science of stratigraphy that is lagging behind in the way that we create data. Because as I, I mentioned before, the data that we create is sometimes quasi-qualitative, but there's another way, right? We can preserve those sections. Now here's a look at one of these point clouds, right? And every single one of those points has a X, Y, and Z coordinate in real space and an RGB color value. And so that's how you can see my yellow field book right there inside that outcrop. Here's the other uh, part of this. Recording our stratigraphy and tabular data, right? And and I'm not talking about using another app or another thing or another program or like an app that's going to solve your life. Or what I am talking about is recording data in the tabular format, a standardized format, right? Like we have all these data standards for mapping and digital data collection, but stratigraphy doesn't yet have that. We don't have a standard way in which we collect stratigraphic data. But if we do it like this tabular, what are we doing? We're setting up that data for the future. Because if we give somebody a stratigraphic chart drawn in Illustrator, even if it's really nice, and even you know if it took you so long to draw, I, I know, um, 
that might be useless for the next generations. Like they might be end up taking that and retooling it into a format that is usable, like tabular format, something that's machine readable, something that's able to be plugged into machine learnings and all types of technologies that we're not even envisioning yet. And the idea is that now this is the entire section, right? So. Uh, this is unpublished data, don't publish it. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the entire section, right, of where we're trying to develop our, um, where we're trying to establish. Y'all were out there with us, those were at the Appalachian Stratigraphy Workshop, but this is the transition through the Devonian Arrow to the Brailleur up top, through that teal, Brailleur's all the way going through that teal. There's the Braille, your four knobs transition, where's the shirt, haha. <laughs> um, and then on the bottom, you can see that transition into the Hampshire, but like, look how illustrative that is compared to this, right? And I absolutely am not here to like, hate on the person that built this because our work started with this. We couldn't have done our work without this, but we wanna do better, right? We want to <laughs> stand on the shoulders of those that came be before us and deliver something to the future generations that they can work with and continue our work, right? Because we're gonna run out of time, right? We all know that. We're not gonna solve all these issues in our careers. We're going to train people that are younger later in our lives and pass it on to them. So all of us that are you know, young or those of you that are younger than me in the room, you're gonna run out of time too. We're gonna run out of time. We wanna set this up so that it's usable for the future. All right, so here's just some a final slide of some hopes and goals, my, my hopes and goals. Um, and this is just for myself. I just want to like coach this all with, you know, I hope anybody in the audience out there or at home wasn't hearing this as like uh, Alan Pitts telling you how you should think. I really wanted to give this talk about the things that have been floating around in my head, talking about them as I kind of enter into early career, you know, geological survey job. So some of these hopes and goals is that creating new digital data that, um, and what I'm trying to do is create digital data that's modern in the sense that it's interoperable, it's scalable, and it's compatible with our other modern data standards. Data that's functional, it's machine readable, and it's enabled for you know somebody to do machine learning. Like I don't do that work. Some people around me might, but in the future, for sure, computers are going to be recognizing signals and rocks that we don't, we're like incapable of doing, and they're going to help us. So that's coming, right? Robots are taking over. I know. Um, the data we want to be clean, and I say clean, meaning that our observations and our interpretations are clearly separated from each other, right? Because when we accidentally bake our, our interpretations into our observations, we create problems for ourselves and those in the future. Um, Unit formations come with pre-baked scales and conceptions, right? We want to actually move away from that so that our unit formations are not limited by scale. They're not limited by these models that might be too rigid or too incomplete to actually describe what's happening in reality. And like I said, the goal that what we want to leave for our next generation is the ability to work in a way where they can see um, what's really written in stone, not the things we left there. And that's it. All right, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, online, you guys can put questions in, in the chat and I will read them. Retired from here in 2008. In the mid 2000s, 2006, 7, and 8, we had the entire state flown in LIDAR. Huh. And uh, there were other states who were very envious of us because we had the entire state. Yeah. We started looking at some of the derivatives from there. And uh, everybody was taken by the basic hill shape. Mm -hmm. But then we took took the hill shape, and instead of having the aspect and slope, we just went slope only. Hmm. Where you have zero, um, uh, uh, yeah, as white and vertical flat. Right. That way you can see 
both sides of the valley. You lose a sense of up and down, but the, de the detail. And uh, the mappers at the time start looking at this and say, oh, I didn't see that before. Yeah. And it was, just, it was something you watch them as they started to look at this as another tool in the yeah. toolbox. And that, that was really fascinating to watch. Yeah, I, I I agree. Like I remember those days when LIDAR was locked up in these little repositories at like different states or different federal agencies, a little bit here, a little bit there. And um, yeah, it was definitely uh, a source of envy. People that were working with LIDAR and people uh, who were not. And I still, I look at that light. We, we do some tricks to our LIDAR as well. Our What we call our in-house blend is a uh, hill shade plus uh, topographic position index. And it does a little bit of the same thing. It reduces that shade. So you're able to better see up and down. Um, but I still look at that all the time. And I feel like, you know, somebody somewhere uh, thinks this is really unfair. You know, like somebody had to do their career in the 80s and 90s. And Take it out of the raster format and put it in the point format. Then you have this giant attribute table. Yeah, right. And that's an issue, but see, I, um, we can maybe chat more about this uh, into some degrees, but see like the point cloud data, the point cloud data from outcrop is really big too. They're like millions of points and the attributes can get out of control. But I think that what's gonna happen, I mean, I, I think that what's out in front of us is that data is cheap. Data is, you know, like whatever, buy that building across the street and fill it with a million terabytes. Um, and, and those things like point cloud densities, I think you're gonna like kind of, I don't know, the processing power is just going to be there and we're going to stop thinking about 100 gigs, uh, you know, 100 gigs as a raster or something even too big, you know. All right, uh, Jay has a comment. Two comments. Uh, love your use of LIDAR and structure for motion. Uh, that was the first comment. <laughs> I don't think these are questions. I think these are just comments. Second. Sam Burkheiser used to say that the true value of the survey was in the pre pre preserved data rather than interpretation. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Kent chimes in, says, uh, wonderful graphics, love the questioning approach, agreed that LIDAR has changed it all. And Kent goes on, goes on to say, I keep thinking that other than the well completion report, subsurface data from environmental investigations has little opportunity for preservation. Subsurface data. Ken, I'm not I'm not sure I'm I read that right. Do you wanna do you wanna unmute and chime in? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, subsurface, subsurface data being observations of subsurface geology when I'm doing an investigation of a uh, environmental condition or site uh, the observations are of course reported to the department of environmental protection but not to the survey uh, other than those well completion reports and uh you know obviously we get down to the nitty-gritty and we know full well that those uh formation lines are not set in stone and we find places where the maps have inaccuracies. We accept them and and we also uh, know that there are improvements that could be made, but we don't really report them back to the survey for preservation there. That's okay. all. Thank you for the comment and uh, Gail, is quick to say that the survey would be happy to preserve whatever subsurface data anyone <laughs> would like to give us. And and uh, yeah, Gail beat me to it because I was going to say the same thing. Is uh, you mentioned the water well records? We're all in this room. We're all familiar with Pagwis. Uh, for oil and gas wells, we have Edwin, which uh, is a repository for um, oil and gas. There's a vast amount of well bores that are drilled in this state that don't fall into either of those categories. Let's think geotechnical, uh, soil infiltration testing, soil, uh, any kind of probe that reaches bedrock, maybe doesn't penetrate. We are currently hatching a plan on how could we ingest all of that data and serve up a database 
similar to Kyogres or similar to anyway. So yeah, uh, Ken, I think that's a good point. And maybe uh, maybe one more uh, one more pitch is I didn't know until my son was an intern at the survey that you had a core library, and I not that I had done a lot of coring in my career, but I know a lot of cores that have been thrown out uh, that might have been. <laughs> Uh, might have filled your warehouse too. I don't know. I'll I'll stop there. On the aerial photography we have back in the 1930s, the real aerial photography is all preserved. Yeah. So Kent, I'm sorry you didn't know about our core library. Uh, we need to make that more uh, accessible and. I, uh, sitting below us, anyone who wants to go on a tour. Uh, yeah, I did donate the last of my uh, cores that I just couldn't throw away that were in my backyard. Good. Uh, John Newbaum came and got them before the boxes rotted away. So hopefully they'll be useful to someone. All right, so uh, Ben raises an interesting question. Uh, have formation names been, quote unquote, set in stone, especially across state lines? So, uh, Alan, let's talk about the the seamless national map and some of the efforts that will need to be done to make that happen. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, right, formation names and formations are, are, are not set in stone. They're all the time uh, upgraded to groups, downgraded to members, uh, shelved completely. So, so they're not set in stone and they and, and in my opinion, they shouldn't be because um, we need adjustments. We need the ability to to make those adjustments. So, um, yeah, so part of what's going on and, um, you know, part of the reason why I've kind of just become so friendly with the folks here in Pennsylvania is because uh, part of what I'm working on over the next two to three years is compilation mapping in the Cumberland 100K uh, quad. And that involves the states of Pennsylvania, Maryland, West Virginia. And, you know, there's a lot of border buses there. There's a lot of state line faults. Uh, so we're trying to clean those up. And it's, it's, a, it's a delicate game of sort of working together and, and being more or less pragmatic about it. That's, that's kind of the thing that I, I feel like is working through pragmatism. And, and so, yeah, we're just kind of trying to develop a regional framework within that. Come, I mean, th that's kind of what in, it's in my brain, in my headspace all the time is developing a regional framework and finding those, not so much the formations, but the stratigraphic levels, right? Those surfaces that are through going through across the state lines and the, you know, lithostratigraphic members that can correlate, but it's hard. It's, 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 it's really hard work. Um, you know, Haley Filippelli has been working on that here at the Pennsylvania survey. Anybody who's in the audience come to uh, the next sort of vision event that's, uh, what date is that, Haley? Uh, it's November 26th. No. no. October 26th. There you go. It's October 26th. So, um, you know, this work that's going on with us, it's sort of an our FedMap project, but it can't really happen without a really close collaboration with our state partners. So um, I think in the old days, it used to go a little bit differently because there wasn't this, uh, you know, sort of direction coming from the mapping program that we should all have seamless geology. I mean, that makes sense. We all shouldn't be out there mapping our quads as fiefdoms and letting our lines terminate up against the boundary and think, all right, you know, who is ever mapping that next quad? They, they can sort it out, right? Um, what we're trying to do now is get, just get a nice regional framework that lets us map across those boundaries better at the scale of 100K, right? Because at a certain scale, like 24,000, that, that's really hard. I don't think you could ever have a 24,000 scale map of uh, the state, <laughs> even the state of Pennsylvania, right? So even like a 250K scale map of the country or the East Coast, like those, those are hard things. Where do you make those decisions of lumping and splitting? How do you make it representative of the reality? What is the reality? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got a question from Alexander. Would there be areas in the field where con conventional concept, that, where the conventional concept of formations may no longer be valid? I'm thinking of some areas 
form where formational boundaries may become so transitional and gradational that trying to relate uh, all material in a formation to a single type section no longer has value or may be misleading. Maybe, maybe um, my help on this question is, all right, so Alan made an inside joke about the shear formation, and, and we giggled because we're part of this workshop where he mentioned the type localities in West Virginia, and uh, we, in Pennsylvania, we mapped the shear, and I think Virginia even found some use for it, but it turns out West Virginia wants to abandon it. They don't think it exists. In the type locality, they're ready to abandon this formation. And we were like, well, wait a minute, we map it, we find value in it. So this is one of those issues that it is gradational, as uh, you know, the, the, the shear does exist, at least in some of our minds. <laughs> but it is it's a tough, it's a tough call. It's reality. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the problem um, you know, is 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 I view is threefold. Mappers talk about mappability, but uh, the problem starts with definition. Uh, the problem starts with how we define the units because then the mappers take that into the field as their marching orders. They've got a definition and now they're going to go out in the field and try to find something that matches that definition. So mappability uh, and definition are kind of related to each other. And so, you know, your state might define something different as a, another state. And yeah, you know, that same narrative about a state defining a type section and defining a formation, and then other states are like, yeah, great, we'll just correlate along, the, we'll, we'll just trace that line on down the section into our state. Um, and then those states abandoned the name, right? So, like, our friends from New York did that to, to a lot of us, sorry, friends from New York, we're still friends. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some of these names that were in New York and they were extended all the way down into Virginia, West Virginia, and then, oops, New York abandons them. So what do we do now? Should we abandon them or do we keep them because we've found merit in them? And you know, it's it's hard. It's hard. Compilation mapping is different than 24K mapping, and and I feel like um, yeah. Well, if there are no more questions, um, we're going to wrap up this month's meeting. Uh, plug for next week. Uh, next, not with not next week. Next month. Uh, as Alan alluded, alluded to, we're going to talk about our drone technology here at the survey. Craig Eversall is our speaker. And I also want to put a plug in for those of you at home. Uh, we had a great time at uh, Tattered Flag having uh, dinner. So if you guys can make it out, that, I think for those of you who joined, don't you think that venue really worked out nice for us? Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, we encourage you, uh, those of you who are online right now, uh, think about joining us next month. Uh, and we'll have tattered, uh, tattered flag, dinner at Tattered Flag to start, and then we'll have the meeting here. So uh, with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, Alan. That was great.